lighting didn't change much until the 1850s. Uh, pretty much this type of thing. <laughs> a container, some kind of fat, lard maybe, and a wick. I'll pass this around because you don't have to worry, this one is not going to break. <laughs> Remember Aladdin in the land? Uh, there were all kinds of containers, but basically it was just a container, fat, and a wick. And that's the way it continued right up through the, uh, the end of the 18th uh, end of the 18th century. Um, at the end of the 18th century, a few new things happened. One of which was the invention of a kind of burning fluid, an alcohol burning fluid, and. Um, this was a real step ahead because before that, um, uh, they were using basically lard. And this alcohol burning fluid burned very clear, very clean, um, very bright, very dangerous. And so it was, a, it was a threat. A lot of people didn't like to have it in their house. But this is an alcohol burner. And I imagine, I don't know, that the reason for this was to make sure that we didn't have any explosions. Uh, a lot of the products that you'll see around here, a lot of the lamps have notices on them, or a few of them, that say, do not burn alcohol in this lamp. It's dangerous. Don't do it. So this, that's an early lamp. Um, another uh, innovation was the, uh, caused by the growth of the whaling industry in the early 1900s, uh, right here. 1800s. 1800s. I'm sorry. I'm, get, I'm getting my centuries and my hundreds mixed up. That's a sure sign of a non-historian. <laughs> um, we, we've all read Moby Dick, so we know that was 1851, right? Um, and when the whaling industry was developed, they, whales are mainly what? Blubber. And blubber makes whale oil, and whale oil is a good burning fuel. So all of a sudden, particularly in this part of the country, there was a source of oil that was um, usable and that was a lot nicer than lard. Um, and whale oil lamps, for some reason, tend to have a form like this. They're much taller, the, the font is smaller, maybe because whale oil was a little more expensive to procure, so you didn't fill up a great big tank. But this is what a, a typical whale oil lamp looks like. I don't have many of these because that's not what I collect. So that's a sort of a quick run through on the pre kerosene era. The big bit of breakthrough occurred <coughs> in 1854 when a, a geologist from Canada discovered a, um, well actually patented in 1854, probably discovered it before that, a, a new burning fuel, which was basically a petroleum based fuel, which he called coal oil or kerosene. And very soon after that, the first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania. So all of a sudden, you had not only the oil, but you had a source of the oil, a big source of the oil. Not You didn't have to go out and kill the whale, you just drill down and it came gushing out of the ground. So this was terrific. And the kerosene had the advantage of being almost smokeless, although most of us have clean chimneys, so we know that's not entirely true. Mostly odorless, but we know when we have one burning, there is an odor, <laughs> but still a great improvement over, can you imagine whale oil? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to live with that? Um, it was cheap, it was readily available, and the uh, people went mad, inventing different containers to burn kerosene. Um, this was this was the United States of America. Most of this inventiveness took place here, and um, scientists, artisans, craftspeople, everyone got into the act and began inventing improved ways of burning kerosene or prettier ways of burning kerosene. Uh, at about the same time, this is just like a cosmic feel going on here. Um, the glass industry in America was developing in exactly the same locations as the oil was developing. So glass making 
had reached a stage where most people were now able to get nice tableware. They couldn't afford crystal, but now they could get pressed glass tableware. And of course, what better application for pressed glass than kerosene lamps? So that came into play as well. Um, between 1850 and 1830, when electrification <coughs> began, almost every house was full of kerosene lamps. And it makes your, my heart go pitter-patter when I think of all those lamps out there that must still be in people's attics. <laughs> because you didn't have just one, you had to have enough uh, to keep your house lit. Um, the second topic I'd like to cover is, is how does one go about collecting lamps and why would you ever do such a silly thing? Uh, of course, people collect almost anything. But the re I started because a friend gave me one as a house present. Uh, and she said she always gave a kerosene lamp to someone who had just bought their first house or to brides and groups. And I thought it was great. She said, you're in New England now and the power is going to go out. <laughs> you're going to need this lamp. Well, the first time the power did go out, we realized we needed more than one. So the next time we went to an auction, I bought another one. And then Henry began to get into the act and he'd go scouting around. There's a kerosene lamp over there. There's a kerosene so we began collecting enough so we'd have one for downstairs, one for upstairs, one for the kids' bedroom, one for the bathroom, one, and they began multiplying like <coughs> rabbits. I really got serious in 1985 when I read about an auction in Fairfield, Maine, run by a guy named James G Julia, and it was exclusively miniature lamps. I'll pass the catalog around. And Many of the mini lamps come from the Julia auctions, although some of them I've picked up other places. Another source of the lamps in this collection is a, a wonderful um, woman named Catherine Thoreau, who's a true expert and a true collector, uh, who, who really has written two books on just on kerosene lamps. And it, it, um, she put her collection on the market. Uh, it was, there were three auctions in Cape Cod, three two-day auctions. Um, this is the catalog from one of them. If you can imagine how many lamps there were. Pass this around to <coughs> And so we were lucky, we're fortunate to be able to acquire some parts of, of her collection. I was saying to Mary Ellen, um, mm -hmm. some lamps can be very, very, very pricey. We don't have any of those. <laughs> I mean, we have some that some of you might think are pricey, but we don't really have any up far end of the scale um, lamps. Okay, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how the uh, exhibit is organized. And I'll have to tell you, it's really arbitrary. I just sort of decided to or organize it this way. This isn't the way. Um, scholars we organized it, I'm sure. It's just the way I organized it. The first um, segment is about furs, wicks, and accessories. And those are all going to be located in that case back behind Randy. So um, <coughs> they're easy to lay down flat. But I'll just show you. Here's a here's just your everyday your everyday burn. This is just your ordinary burn that most of you have seen in kerosene lamps that you have. This is a double wick burner. Very high power, twice as much light. Big, wide wicks. This goes on one of my lamps here. You just pass those. Oh, everything's going every which way that one. Very disorganized. And this one is like the baby bear. <laughs> this is one from one of the mini lamps. So you can get a sense just in burners. The, the differences that can exist, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the same thing is true for wicks. Can we ask questions as they crop up? Yeah, sure. Is there a, if this wick hole is one inch, can you put a half inch wick in? Yeah, but it sort of slips around. Come on in, Erica. We have a special chair for you right here. All right, in front. This is my realtor. <laughs> 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 this 
This, this is a round wick, which is developed for a special kind of a, a, a burner. This one uses a round wick, and this one uses a round wick. And the, the advantage of that is the burner allows, it's round, the wick goes around it, air can get up and down every which way. So for and plus, you have all that area to burn brightly. And here's some little different sizes. I didn't put them all out, but they're more back in the case. There's there's many different kinds of wicks and burners as you could possibly imagine. I totally I totally neglected chimneys, but there's a, as great a variety of chimneys as as you can tell by just looking around and globes. Uh, but I don't I don't talk about that much. I don't know much about. Um, and besides, that, I didn't want to carry all that stuff here. I have boxes and boxes of chimneys. And sometime I'm going to invite my friends over and we'll just unpack chimneys and wash them. <laughs> <laughs> um, another section is um, special purpose lamps. Lamps that are, are, were made for some particular purpose. And I'll just show you two examples. Um, this one. Is a vapocresoline lamp. Did anyone ever have one of these in their room when they were sick as a child? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I'm going to put this back legally. This one I, I have, I'm lucky I have the packaging too, and it's like a, it's a vaporizer. <laughs> and you took this really vile smelling <laughs> medicine and you put it in this little dish and then you lit the lamp. And the heat, <coughs> it's vile smelling. <coughs> Dr. McLean, would you like to comment on the <laughs> I prefer echinacea. It's really vile. <laughs> and it has all kinds of warnings on it, like poison. <laughs> and on the side it says, watch out. <laughs> Don't that's get that's it on your name. Cresoline. Cresoline? Yeah. What's the chemical? It smells like tar to me. It's probably cigarette juice or something. <laughs> um, the other special purpose, these are all special purpose, but um, the one that I'm sort of fond of is this wedding bouquet um, lamp. It's very romantic, but it's a cigar lighter. The wedding bouquet was a kind of um, cigar brand, I guess. And so this would have been used in a hotel or a, a, a men's club or a lodge or a, a, maybe a, a lounge of a restaurant or something like that. And this was actually an alcohol lamp. So this is probably a little earlier than some of the rest of the collection. The font was filled with alcohol. You lit, there's a little round burner like that one has here. And then you pull out your cigar and do all that stuff with guys do with cigars. And then you took this little lighter out, which had a little drop of alcohol on it from the font, and then lit it here. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> but I don't like cigars. But I don't like cigars. <laughs> so there are a lot of different special purpose lamps there that you can look at at your leisure. Um, there's a good example of the old marketing ploy, find, find a need and fill it. The next category is composite lamps, and these lamps here are examples of composite lamps. This one has a, uh, a frosted font and morning glory pattern. It has a sandwich glass, hand-painted um, stem, and interestingly enough, it, at a different auction, I got this vase, which is clearly made in the same place, um, also sandwich glass. A composite lamp is just a lamp that's made up of different pieces. And this was wonderful for the, um, for the manufacturers because they just took made components and then put them together, mix and match, to make people happy. So whatever they wanted, they could have. A very good example is these two. Uh, they have identical bases. Um, that's the Blackberry base, very common, but different fonts. 
one is the diamond cluster and this one's the star pattern. But they both have the same connector, and that's this part here that joins this part to this part. And this was made by the Hobbs Glass Company. You always know a Hobbs lamp when you see it because it's got this trademark connector. And they just, I probably have six or seven or eight of these in different bottoms, different tops, same connector. So those are composite lamps, and there's a whole, there's a few of them over there. Um, another category is all glass lamps, and those are over here. Uh, this is a pretty one. This is, um, this is also a Hobbs lamp, but it doesn't have the Hobbs connector because it's all glass, and it's got a cobalt blue base and a Snowden pattern top. And um, whenever you have a glass that has a color, it's worth more. So you be very careful with this. You can't touch it. <laughs> I know some of these people. They're very clumsy. <laughs> Another, this, this cabinet over here is full of miniature lamps. And I'll just show you two examples. Um, this one is, a, I think it's a pretty one. Uh, that's a little night light. And I believe this was made in a full-size lamp as well, which I think would be very beautiful, wouldn't it? And, it? and you can imagine how pretty it is with the light showing through this. Um, it's a pressed glass lamp, but it's made, it's very fine glass, so it's made to look like cut glass. It's called a stars and bars pattern. And then this one is a favorite of mine. This is a, a glow lamp. And a glow lamp is characterized by a very special burner. It's a little glass onion with a stem, sort of. And then the wick is threaded up through that glass stem. And I, I can't show you because I'll get covered with kerosene. But you know how hard it would be to shove a little like shoelace up through the glass stem. So there's a wire that twists around it. And so you sort of untwist the wire, wrap it around the loosen the wick and wrap it up again. It's really quite amazing. That's a pretty thing, I think. Isn't there are a couple of glow lamps over there. In this case, over here. Um, another category is the banquet or parlor lamps. And they're here. And across here. <laughs> um, this one's a favorite that we have on our, usually have on our, our mantle place looks very bare right now because all our lamps are gone. But uh, this one we have on our mantle usually. It's a Bradley and Hubbard lamp. Bradley and Hubbard was a, a big manufacturer of high quality lamps. Um, it has, when you, when you get up and look at it, it has a wonderful design of a hunter, a rural background dogs, he's shooting his gun, birds are falling out of the sky. I mean, it's a whole story right here on this um, wonderful chimney. It's a, I think it's a really pretty lamp. Banquet lamps were tall so that the light came down on the table, but you didn't have the light in your eyes. Parlor lamps, on the other hand, tend to be a little smaller, but very, very pretty, <laughs> because they would, they would be something that you would want to <coughs> sort of show off with. So um, these are some examples of parlor lamps. Um, another one is, this is another favorite, but this is a very, very recent lamp. This is an Aladdin lamp. It has any of the, who has one? Oh, Peter has one. Um, these were invented in about 1909. So that's pretty getting pretty close to the end of the kerosene age because electrification took place in the 30s. So the guy that invented this got on the boat sort of late. late. But um, he combined a, a special burner, like the one I mentioned before, with it, with, so the air could get up through it, with a mantle. So you get the combination of a, a round wick and a mantle. And I'll light it for you in a little bit of time. It was a wonderful improvement. It's offered it looks <laughs> a lot like when it's lit, it looks like a Coleman lantern. It's very bright. And, and pretty, and this one is a Washington drape that came in all different patterns. The Aladdin um, Lamp Company, well, over here, they also were great innovators in technology, and they went through 
uh, many iterations of burners. You can see some of their diagrams. This was the first one, this is the second one, and I don't know how many there were. But they're still making lamps today. It's one of the few kerosene when uh, I talked to their marketing guy, hoping they would give us some material, which they didn't. Um, and I said, gee, you're the only game in, in town for kerosene lamps. And I said, it must be like selling buggy whips. <laughs> but they still sell a lot to um, developing countries because it's, it is a wonderful lamp. Um, and I buy people who own them buy the parts for them too. Uh, and the uh, next category is occupational lamps. So those are here. Those are all, again, that might be called special purpose lamps. Lamps developed for a certain purpose. This is, I'm told, a miner's lamp. It weighs a ton. And um, let's see if I can make it do its little trick. There. <laughs> it's, got it, it's got its own lighter down there in the dark. You know, we don't want to be messing around with the matches. Those are fun looking canaries. <laughs> oh, yeah, I might have a good idea. I should have brought a canary. Um, this one is a policeman's lamp. This was an early flashlight. And it has a terrific bullseye glass to magnify the light. And, and here's a little fuel canister inside. Um, it said in my resource that this was mid 17th century. I do not believe that, except that the wick is hand spun yarn and it's very old and brown. So it could, it's probably old, but I don't think it's that old. But here's the cool part. If you're, you're a policeman, right? And, and you want to sneak up on your criminal. So, <laughs> so you light your light, you close the little door, latch it, and then when you get open it, say, ha ha, caught you, you miscreant. It could also be used for sending signals. Probably moved a little more fluently. <laughs> okay. And then there is also a very small section over here of some contemporary lamps because once you start collecting something, if you see one and you like it, you don't care how old it is, you just buy it. There's one from Venice, there's one from the uh, state of Washington, there's a little pottery one. And my personal favorite, my mother in law lamp. It was called, that's what the artist who made it called it a mother-in-law lamp, and the flame burns from the top of her head. <laughs> I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> okay, and then I just want to show you my personal two favorites. This is Little Harry's Nightlight, and you can understand why I like it, because it's so cute and tiny. It's three and a half inches. And then my other personal favorite is this lamp down here. It has wild birds on it. We bought that in Campo, uh, Campo Bello Marketplace in London. Is that right? Yeah. And um, I packed it up for safekeeping in my backpack, went to the airport, and customs gave us a very hard time. They made me unpack it, they took it out, they inspected it, they took the metal canister out. They were convinced either that it was a bomb or that I was smuggling drugs in the canister. And we were almost late for our plane, so um, that has a very special place in my heart. <laughs> the children were not happy to with my husband. <laughs> okay, well that's really the end of the talk, and Sally's come just in time, but it's on tape. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought what I'd like to do is just show you three lamps lit. I was going to have a blaze, but that's not safe. This is um, just your ordinary, but I think very pretty little um, all glass lamp, which is, this is called the hackle pattern. I think it's, I think it's pretty. So this would be just like the house, the lamp you'd have next to your bed or on the table in the hall by the one you carry to take people to bed. And then uh, another one I'd like to show you is this one. So
negligence on my part. Oh, this is, isn't this something? The, the mantle is really structured as a part of the chimney. And the, rip, the wick is round. This is the burner that lets the air up and down. But unfortunately, I've abused the wick a little bit. So it's raggedy. And I tried to clean it um, up, but I didn't do a very good job. So it's not going to burn with its true glory. But you've got the idea. So you light the wick. Two. If we had a few hours, we could get this going properly. <laughs> then you put the mantle on, and then you turn it up. You have to do it slowly. But you can see what happens. When it, when it has time to warm up, it will get white, bright, you can really read by it. Um, so those are the lamps. <coughs> now, does anybody have any questions? In walking in a small shop in a distant country, can you stumble upon unique lamps just lying on the shelf? Well, I stumbled upon this one in um, Venice. And there were prettier ones. <laughs> Did you learn anything about the provenance of the lamp when you buy it in a place like that? You just don't no, that's one of the problems uh, very often. Well, sometimes you'll, it depends on the shop that you're dealing with. If, if it's a big shop with a dealer who knows what they're doing, yes, you can, can get some information. But sometimes it's just, do you like it or do you not like it? Um, if you know your stuff, then you can tell the age of the lamp by, by the, uh, the collar. Of the lamp, this portion right here. You can, a really good person, like, I'm sure Catherine Thoreau could date, could, you could put lamps on a table and she could tell you that's 1870, that's 1880, that's 1890, and that one's from China. Because <laughs> there are lamps from China. One example of that is this beautiful all glass lamp over here called Princess Feather. Uh, this was a late lamp. This was a 1890, I think. It was one of the most popular lamps patterns ever produced. And you can see it's much more ornate than some of the others that are more in keeping with the earlier, simpler time, toward the end of the Victorian period. Very, very fancy, very elaborate. And they made it in every color. They made it in every style. Some had long stems, some had short stems, some were finger lamps, some were green, some were pink, some were blue, some were amber. Um, and they continued making them into, well, into the 20th century. Um, the problem is they were so popular that they're still making them, but not the same quality. So sometimes you will see a lamp in this pattern. You'll say, oh, I know that. That's princess feather. And really, it's not princess feather. It's a knockoff of princess feather. And you, the only way you would know is if you know what a real princess feather looks like. The copies are not are much cruder. So you can get, you can make mistakes. Yes, Linda. Passing around that little lamp at the beginning brought back wonderful memories to me because when we lived in India, they had a festival called Diwali, and at that, on that festival in the evening, everybody put their little lamp out with a little twisted cotton, and if they were very poor, it would be in a little red, uh, the red clay, or it might be in brass. And everybody, the whole city, the whole countryside would have these little lamps burning. Oh, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. We should put that on the bulletin board. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful story. Any other questions or any reminiscences? How do you get those so shiny and clean inside? What do you do? Well, um, my secret is dishwasher detergent. And Windex. So mm -hmm. for the what do you use? There's a kerosene. The tap 
Yeah, you just put a little dish, like a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of dishwasher detergent in there, let it soak for a while, swish it out, rinse it out. Wow. And, yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you. I didn't really spend a lot of time cleaning them. Sorry. Okay. You'll well, look, if you look, you'll you see. <laughs> and, and I didn't spend any time at all polishing because uh, a lot of these lamps are brass or they're brass on copper. And if you polish them, you ruin them. So I, I leave, leave the patina, we say it's meant to be that way. Add value. Would there still be auctions limited solely to kerosene lamps? Sure. Yeah. In all uh, parts of the country? Yeah, I mean, here are, here are just a few that we've attended, so you can, you can go to just lamp auctions, and some of them now, uh, some of them that we've been to are art glass lamps, so some of them are electrified, like Tiffany lamps and handle lamps and so forth, uh, but they also will usually have some kerosene lamps too, so yeah, you can go to auctions still that just have lamps. We get notices of maybe what, once, twice a year from Julia? Yeah, Julia has a couple of lamp auctions every year. That's up in Fairfield. Um, so let's see, you, can, you can do that if you want to. That's the easy way, to go to an auction. Where the, that's all they have. The hard way is to go to, to individual auctions that where they all might have two lamps or to use furniture stores or uh, antique shops, but you're going to pay more in antique shops. So that's the disadvantage of that. Any other questions? Is there a place where you can replace the uh, chimney straw if you happen to have the, the bottom part? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very good, I think, I think I've got the right place. Um, it's in Norway, Obershans. It has a lot of um, lamp parts. They even have mini burners, burners little tiny burners for mini lamps. And chimneys for, for mini lamps. Uh, and I, they have Latin lamp parts. So, yes, you can. And, and even Kmart, I think, sells chimneys. So. Or Walmart. I have a little nothing, but I've never been able to find a chimney. Well, measure it for me, and I probably have one. I have many boxes of them. Any other questions? Or? Reminiscences. Okay, well, thank you very much and enjoy the show. <laughs>